It is in the nature of the infinite by its Descartes, not to be comprehended by me, who am finite. I have that written, slightly lopsided, thanks to my short-sightedness and short stature, above the interactive whiteboard in my classroom. And it might seem to settle the matter, in which case we might as well finish here. Except that I believe there is more that can be said or attempted. And in this lecture I am going to present what I consider to be the best theological method which enables us to apprehend, to the extent finite beings can, the infinite. Firstly, a few disclaimers and some definitions. By theology, I mean almost literally talk about God. It comes from the Greek theos and God and logos, word. Theologians by no means have to believe in God, but the task of theology is not to debate God's existence, but rather his nature and or works. I'll be using a masculine pronoun as befits convention. Of course, God is not believed to have a sex as he is metaphysical. The word imaginal I shall define later, but it's not synonymous with imaginary, though it does have something to do with it. Theology, then, is not the same as philosophy, although it may employ it. Philosophy, as you know, is love of wisdom. Philosophy is wonderful, it's vigorous and useful. The 20th century philosopher Wittgenstein thought that the task of philosophy was to lay everything before us clearly, and his famous preface to the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus claims that whatever can be said at all can be said clearly, and whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Now, philosophy might get you to the existence of a prime mover, or a that than which nothing greater can be conceived, but there it stops, and theology must take up the mantle. So this lecture, although largely focused on Christian theology, neither expects nor requires any belief in Yahweh, Christ, or the flying spaghetti monster, come to that. For our purposes, and for shorthand, I assume two of these to be true. Lord, teach me to know and understand which of these should be first, to call on you or to praise you, and likewise to know you or to call on you. But who calls upon you without knowing you? For he that knows you may not may call upon you as other than you are, or <laughs> perhaps we shall call on you that we may know you. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So opens St Augustine of Hippo's Confessions. St Augustine of Hippo, incidentally, not to be confused with St Augustine of Canterbury, who brought Christianity to England in the 6th century. In terms of method, theology has to decide whether to begin with God or with man, whether we must wait for revelation or whether we can speak of God on our own. And over the centuries, roughly four approaches to theological method have been adopted. So reason uses the tools of philosophy, essentially. The drawback is clearly the limits of human knowledge and intellectual power. Then we have scripture. Now, depending on how inerrant, if we have ever you believe the scriptures to be, make this more or less attractive. In the wake of biblical scholarship, of historical source, redaction, criticism, and the problems of translation, this is difficult too, not that we should abandon it tradition. This takes on received wisdom. If you like it, the church and its teaching and its theologians. The clear drawback is that you might very well follow something that's wrong because it's traditional, such as drowning witches. Finally, experience, which might include our senses and other ineffable religious experiences. The latter would seem to be the way to understand God as its direct from the horse's mouth, so to speak, but again, may not be reliable. Theology used to be called the Queen of Science. That might seem strange in a post-Darwinian secular zeitgeist, but consider the etymology of the word science, which comes to us from the Latin word for knowledge. Yet, truth, or rather knowledge, is, as St Paul says, only partial, for we know in part and this has put some people off using reason, and the fideistic approach would abandon it altogether. Fortunately, there's a long history of employing reason in theology. St. Anselm of Canterbury, in the 11th century, wrote Credo ut intelligam, 
I believe in order to understand. And after him, the great medieval theologians, Thomas of Aquinas, wrote four and a half thousand pages of what we call systematic theology, the Summa Theologiae. This might explain, incidentally, why he was so fat, and he basically just spent all day writing. It is my excuse, too. Aquinas had to have a special desk made to fit round his belly. A little-known fact about Aquinas is that he came from a very affluent and important family, much like McMafia, if you've ever seen that. Uh, catch up on your favourite streaming service, if not. The protagonist is played by the actor James Norton, and he studies theology in the year below me at Cambridge, so if your parents ask you what you can do with a degree in theology, you can say nothing, but you could always become a, an actor afterwards. Anyway, Aquinas was kidnapped by his own brothers on the way to Paris and thrown into the family dungeon, all because he wanted to become an abbot. They tempted him, as the story goes, with a prostitute, but then he chased about with a red-hot poker and burnt a cross into the door, and then set about writing his systematic theology. As you do. Systematic theology is quite literally an attempt to systematise the questions of theology. It usually treats questions about the nature of God, of man, of salvation, of Christ, if Christian, etc. Yet again, before we can start to know that we can talk about God, for, as Aquinas notes, we cannot in this life know God's essence as he is in himself, but only know how he is for us, or pro nobis. We shouldn't be surprised. We only know all things as they are pro nobis. Consider our relationships with other people, for example. You might know me as a teacher, or a philosopher, a writer. My brother knows me as his twin, my mother as her son, my wife as her husband, my daughter as her father. We do not know anyone completely because omniscience would be required for that. It's the same with objects. And this is why I believe we all employ another faculty when we think of things. A faculty I call the imaginal. Imagination equips us to be resilient. That was said in an assembly a few years ago. I agree. But there is even more. Wordsworth, the great romantic poet of the 18th and 19th centuries, describes imagination thus in the prelude. Imagination, which in truth is but another name for absolute power and clearest insight, amplitude of mind and reason in her most exalted mood. This faculty hath been the feeding source of our long labour. We have traced the stream from the blind cavern whence is faintly heard its natal murmur, followed it to light an open day, accompanied its course among the ways of nature, for a time lost sight of it, bewildered and engulfed, then given it greeting as it rose once more in strength, reflecting from its placid breast the works of man and face of human life. And lastly... From its progress have we drawn faith in life endless, the sustaining thought of human being, eternity, and God. The problem with the word imagination or imagined is that it carries connotations of being made up. By imaginal, I mean with recourse to the imagination, but not necessarily invented. It images forth in our mind's eye what isn't immediately present to our senses. I borrow the term from French philosopher and theologian Henri Corbin, who explicates the distinction between imaginal and imagined. The imaginal is everything that surpasses the order of common empirical perception and is individualised in a personal vision, undemonstrable by simple recourse to the criteria of sensory knowledge or rational understanding. So this is why I agree with Wordsworth, that it is akin to reason. Indeed, reason employs the imaginal when not talking in tautologies. So let's conduct an experiment. How many windows are there in Westminster Abbey? If you've been there, if you've been a member of Harris Westminster Sick Form, you would have been there several times. And seen it most days, depending on which way you walk up Tothill Street. And in order to hazard a guess, we might recall a picture in our mind's eye or memory. 
but we know that our memories are imperfect. So there's a dissonance between the Abbey in our minds and the Abbey across the road. For shorthand, let's use the Latin terms. In intellectu, in the mind, and in re, in reality. Now, I mentioned St Anselm of Canterbury. Not all of you, I expect, have seen Canterbury Cathedral, but you understand what a cathedral is, and you can probably guess what it might look like. For those of you who have never seen a cathedral, here are some cathedrals. You can't know what you've not experienced, it would seem. This is why Tennyson writes in the prologue of In Memoriam, We have but faith we cannot know, for knowledge is of things we see. And this is what I mean by the imaginal, an imaging forth of what is not before us. Image forth. So when I talk of something or someone you've not seen and, and you give that thing or person attributes, are we talking about the same object? In my contacts, I have an entry called OCD Cleaner. I have never met this cleaner um this was uh someone that i wanted to employ the services of um and i was looking for a cleaner when i needed to uh, vacate a previous flat and uh i asked a friend for some recommendations and they said oh yes uh, i know this cleaner uh bit ocd um but they're amazing and i thought well an ocd cleaner is probably just what i need and so I put in this OCD cleaner in my contact. I, I don't think I ever um, got to meet them. So I don't even know if it was a man, a woman, old or young, etc., etc. And now if I tell you about my friend Alex, you'll immediately ascribe them a, a sex and ethnicity and age, other attributes. I wonder what I think if I tell you about Alex. If I were to show you a photo, I won't, I haven't got their permission. But which of you would have erroneously ascribed sex, age, ethnicity, and so forth. It is, to almost spoil the denouement for those of you yet to read Sense and Sensibility, a classic case of muddling the thing in intellectu with the thing in re. For some time, the heroine, Miss Dashwood, has been in love with Mr Edward Ferrers, and she receives this news. I suppose you know, ma'am, that Mr. Feathers is married. Marion gave a violent start, fixed her eyes upon Eleanor, saw her turning pale and fell back in her chair in hysterics. Mrs. Dashwood, whose eyes, as she answered the servant's inquiry, had intuitively taken the same direction, was shocked to perceive by Eleanor's countenance how much she really suffered. And in a moment afterwards, a light distress by Marion's situation you not on which child to bestow her principal attention. But of course, Eleanor checks its veracity. Who told you that Mr. Ferris was married? Thomas? I seen Mr. Ferris myself, ma'am, this morning, and next day, and his lady, too, Miss Dealers was. They was stopping in the chaise at the door of the New London Inn, and as I went there with a message from Sally at the park to her brothers, who is one of the postboys. And so we continue. You see where this is going with God. If we give him a different attribute, are we talking about a different God? And to what extent is our language the sum of our theology? We're back to Augustine of Hippo. For he knows that no, for he that knows you not may call upon you as other than you are. And speaking of Augustine, you might have thought of him as an old white guy with a beard. He was African and probably black. This calling by another name we will return to in the last battle. I decided not to spoil the end of Sense and Sensibility for you, but it's a bit of a shocker. So, to conclude this preamble, it's my thesis that we draw on what we know to fill in what we don't know. But what we don't know 
Warte hier. So, to conclude my preamble, it is my thesis that we draw on what we know to fill in what we don't know. But what we don't know... So, to conclude this preamble, it is my thesis that we draw on what we know to fill in what we don't know. But we don't know what's in front of us. Consider a die on a table. You cannot see at once all its six sides, but your imaginal faculty fills in the blank. You would assume that the number on the bottom is one. Actually, this is a munchkin die uh, from a board game, and uh, instead of a one, it has a little munchkin on it. And this is the essence of the imaginal faculty, the building blocks of metaphor and simile. Metaphor from the Greek meta, meaning above or beyond or over, and phero, which is to carry, so it carries us beyond or over above what is present. Now, this does not mean it isn't true, which brings us on to another word in my title, mythopoeia. C.S. Lewis once called myths lies breathed through silver. His friend J.R.R. Tolkien, whom at first Lewis referred to as only a second-class friend, wrote a poem for Lewis called Mythopoeia, in which he defended the making of myths, suggesting that it was in some way myth that made man. The heart of man is not compound of lies, but draws some wisdom from the only wise and still recalls him. There are echoes of this in 21st century philosopher-theologian Douglas Headley, who tells us it is not history that determines the mythology of a people, but the mythology which determines history. Tolkien goes on to argue that in paradise they still will make, not being dead, and poets shall have flames upon their head. The place of imagination and poetry in philosophy and theology has remained ambiguous. Plato would not have had poets in his Republic, although he would start education with fiction. Will allow Plato to be wrong about something and return to Tolkien, who draws a distinction between imagination and fancy or fantasy. He calls this world the primary world, and perhaps we shall agree because it is the world we appear to first experience, but it is, of course, the later world, the shadow world, as Plato would have it. And it is later because it is created and born from the mind of God. The images are of things not in this primary world, if that indeed is possible, is a virtue, not a vice. Fantasy in this sense is, I think, not a lower, but a higher form of art. Indeed, the most nearly pure form, and so, when achieved, the most potent. He goes further to say that fantasy is not, is, he goes He goes further to say that fantasy is a rational, not an irrational activity, which reminds me of Wordsworth. Unfortunately for Tolkien, fantasy too often remains undeveloped. It is and has been used frivolously, or only half seriously, or merely for decoration. It remains merely fanciful. It's presumably why he spent so long on the language and histories of Middle-earth, and I refer you to other excellent lectures on the history, geography and politics of Middle-earth. Tolkien was quite serious in this point, though, that we are sub-creators. The so-called willing suspension of disbelief, writes Tolkien, does not seem to me a good description of what happens. What really happens is that the story maker proves a successful sub-creator. He makes a secondary world which your mind can enter. Inside it, what he relates is true. It accords with the laws of that world. You therefore believe it while you are, as it were, inside. The moment disbelief arises, the spell is broken. The magic, or rather art, has failed. It is therefore a right, if not a duty, of man to engage in mythopoeia or myth-making, as he again argues in the aforementioned poem. It was our right, used or misused, 
The right is not decayed. We make still by the law in which we're made. Yes, wish fulfilment dreams we spin to cheat our timid hearts and ugly fact defeat. In other words, the role of the imagination is to aid and abet our escape of the hard, painful ugliness of reality. Yet, as I want to demonstrate, it is precisely the imagination that enables us to learn more about and look in closer detail at reality. Owen Barfield showed Lewis that myth has a central place in the whole of language and literature. Lewis had regarded mythopoeia, the making of myths, as a symptom of corruption in humanity, and in a letter to his great friend Arthur Greaves wrote that all religions, that is to say, all lies, Owen Barfield showed Lewis that myth has a central place in the whole of language and literature. The young, atheistic C.S. Lewis had regarded mythopoeia, the making of myths, as a symptom of corruption in humanity, and in a letter to his great friend Arthur Greaves wrote that all religions, that is, all mythologies, to give them their proper name, are merely man's own invention. Primitive man found himself surrounded by all sorts of things he didn't understand. What more natural than to suppose that these were animated by spirits? Gradually, by being mere spirit, nature spirits, these supposed beings were elevated into more elaborate ideas, such as the old gods, and when man became more refined, he pretended that these spirits were as good as well as powerful. Thus, religion, that is to say, mythology, grew up. However, throughout the next 20 or so years, and through his conversing with Tolkien, Lewis gradually came to regard Christianity as myth become fact, or true myth. So that in a letter to the same friend 15 years later, he wrote, The story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference that it really happened. And one must be content to accept it in the same way, remembering that it is in God's myths where the others are men's myths, i.e. the pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of poets, while Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call real things. The latter part of the earlier quotation is most interesting when examining Lewis's treatments of his other religions, particularly in reference to Tash and the Calomens in The Horse and His Boy and The Last Battle. Lewis wants to maintain that there are elements of truth in all religions, and indeed the mythological aspect of them is true in the sense that God is expressing himself through the minds of poets. The young Tash worshipper Emeth in The Last Battle is welcomed into Aslan's country at the end as a son, because, Aslan explains, I take to me the service which thou hast done to Tash. It is not because T Aslan and Tash are one, but because they are opposites. The disguise is thin throughout these two books. It's quite obvious, I think, that Lewis is drawing a parallel with Islam and Arab peoples. But leaving politics aside, we find ourselves drawn to the method out of the story behind the story. In the myth of Tash, Emeth heard the true myth of Aslan and sought him with all his heart and thus found him. And thus for Lewis... Other man-made myths or religions contain behind them the true myth of Christianity. In light of this understanding of the ability of myth and story to engender and transmute truth, it's not surprising that Lewis and his inkling friends turned to mythopoeia themselves. They started writing stories. I really love C.S. Lewis, um, as you might be able to tell, um, in fact... One of my possessions is this um, little, um, I don't know what you call it, monument, statuette. Um, anyway, it uh, depicts, here we have Tolkien, and here C.S. Lewis um, playing some chess, and there's um, a copy here of The Hobbit and The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, which was uh, given to me by my wife some years ago. Um, in fact, uh, that shelf is dedicated to their writings. Um, those of you who haven't yet read 
Narnia Chronicles or any of his other work at Info Treat. And those of you who have read and reread it or other works will not be surprised at that why it is that I love him so much. Those of you who have read them once and think that's fine, well, there's no hope for you. There's little hope if you're yet to discover them for the first time. An unliterary man, writes C.S. Lewis, may be defined as one who reads books once only and thinks that is done with the matter. C.S. Lewis is memorialised in Westminster Abbey. He had the misfortune of dying on the same day as a US president and also Aldous Huxley and somewhat obscured, therefore, his passing. Lewis's most famous creation is, of course, the Chronicles of Narnia. I should begin by telling you that, contrary to popular belief, Lewis did not set out to write an allegory. Of course, Narnia is not allegorical. Neither are the characters in his Space or Cosmic Trilogy, which he wrote before Narnia. They do not merely stand for other beings. In I should begin by telling you that, contrary to popular belief, Lewis did not set out to write an allegory. Of course, Narnia is not allegorical, neither are the characters in his space or cosmic trilogy, which he wrote before Narnia. They do not merely stand in for other beings in a way which is easily exhausted. Rather, they are tautagorical. They point as much to themselves as to the beyond. Narnia began, says Lewis in an interview in the Radio Times, with a picture one thing I am sure of, all seven of my Narnia books and my three science fiction books began with seeing pictures in my head. At first they were not a story, just pictures, but when Aslan came bounding into it, he pulled the whole story together, and soon he pulled the other six Narnian stories in after him. Now, starting from the position that human intellect is incurably abstract, Lewis says that it is only while receiving the myth as a story that you experience the principle concretely. What flows into you from the myth is not truth, but reality. Truth is always about something, but reality is about that which it truth is. Thus, Lewis turned to story and asked, suppose. Suppose, thought Lewis, that there were a land like Narnia, and that the Son of God, as he became a man in our world, became a lion there. And then imagine what would happen. Not enough work seems to have been done on an attempt to draw a synthesis between the Chronicles of Narnia and the Cosmic Trilogy, yet it seems apparent that Lewis is doing much of the same sort of thing in both collections. And in fact, Narnia is an extension of the work begun in the trilogy. If you have a religion, said Lewis, it must be cosmic. He was therefore surprised that the genre of science fiction was so late in arriving. More of that later. As time is a little short, I thought I'd draw out a few ways in which Lewis is able to explore theological themes better than via a systematic theology. Firstly, being able to talk of God as Trinity. In the Space Trilogy, the eternal Son of God is called Maleldil. In Narnia, he is Aslan, whose father is the Emperor over the sea. These are new mythologies, new pictures to understand the infinite with. Yet Lewis recognises the difficulty of language as a barrier to understanding. In The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the children are to be sent back to their own world. And uh, I'll, I'll put a link to the video uh, clip, but as it's copyrighted and I don't have the copyright, I will instead read you the extract. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, before we go... Will you tell us when we can come back to Narnia again, please? And, oh, do, do, do make it soon. Dearest, said Aslan very gently, you and your brother will never come back to Narnia. Oh, Aslan, said Edmund and Lucy both together in despairing voices. You are too old, children, said Aslan, and you must begin to come close to your own world now. It isn't Narnia, you know, sobbed Lucy. It's you. We shan't meet you there. And how can we live never meeting you? But you shall meet me, dear one, said Aslan. 
Are you there too, sir? said Edmund. I am, said Aslan. But there I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. This was the very reason why you were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. Secondly, salvation. In Evil and the God of Love, John Hick argues that we have not become fully human by the time we die, and he finds it necessary to postulate an existence or existence says beyond the grave which will enable us to continue our sanctification, which he sees as not as a setting apart, but as a, a becoming perfect before we eventually all merit heaven. Hick thus reinstates a sort of purgatory via the philosophical back door. The chain of reasoning is not unsound. It's actually a little like Kant, who says that because an ought implies a can, it must be possible for morality to achieve its end, and so we must postulate a God and a world that is future to us. Yet both Hick and Kant seem to agree that eternal bliss ought to be some reward and that we ought to be able to earn salvation by perfecting ourselves over a very long time post-mortem. I think this misses the whole charisma or message of the gospel, which is about the abundance of the grace of God and his love. Yet no amount of philosophical or systematic theology does it quite so well as Lewis in The Void of Dawn Treader. Eustace Scrub, as you remember, has been a bit of a bully throughout and a bit of a greed monster, and he's found his way into a dragon lair, stolen its treasure, and been transmuted into a dragon. There are obviously interesting ethical things to say as well. Now, characters want to leave the island, but a dragon can't very well fit onto a ship. I mean, have you tried? It's very hard. If he sneezes, he's likely to blow the jolly thing up. So he tries to get rid of his scales, but there are too many layers. Then... He encounters Aslan, and this is how Eustace reports it later. Then the lion said, I don't know if it spoke. You will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claw, I can tell you. I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I, I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. The very first hair he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart, and when he began pulling the skin off it, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. Crudely speaking, in the traditional theological language, we cannot get rid of our own sin. God must do it for us, whether or not we deserve it. We just need to let him. That would be the theological point, but it's rather more crude when you leave out the story. A third theological insight, Lewis explores imaginally is evil. Now it might interest you to learn that Tolkien strongly disliked the line in which the wardrobe. Uh, he found it too didactic as well as failing to sustain the reality he said of the secondary world. He, he felt Lewis had rushed his opus and resorted to something of a syncretist, uh, syncretistic attitude towards mythology. So Father Christmas appearing in the same world as fauns and nymphs. He perhaps needed to read Planet Narnia which explains Lewis had much more going on than mere Christianity, if you'll excuse the pun. Each of the seven Narnian chronicles is based on one of the medieval planets. Wardrobe is based on Jupiter, which is about mirth. Father Christmas epitomises Jove. Sadly, Planet Narnia was published this century and Tolkien was dead, so we won't hold it against him. Nevertheless, even without this insight, we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking of Narnia as allegorical. As the biographer of the Inklings Humphrey Carpenter writes, the events of the Christian story are reimagined by Lewis rather than allegorised, and the reader is left free, as he never is with allegory, to interpret it in whatever fashion he pleases. Indeed, if the line The Witch and the Wardrobe were allegory, it should be a failure. Aslan does not die for the entire race of Narnia, but for one human only. There's no suggestion that Aslan's death has atoned for all sins ever committed or to be committed in Narnia. Now the answer for this is perhaps given in The Magician's Nephew, where we learn that Narnia has not fallen like our world, but that Adam's race brought evil into it. And this is similar to the state of Malachandra, which is Mars in Out of the Silent Planet, the first of the books in the Cosmic Trilogy. Lewis imagines our solar system to be in harmony, each planet overseen by an Eldilla, which are sort of angels. In fact, 
often what I'll do is I'll just pop up a little glossary for you. However, the, the elder in charge of Earth, which he calls Thulconja, the eponymous silent planet, bent away from the good. He's known as the Bent One, Satan, and he subsequently invades Malachandra so that evil was introduced into that world. But his inhabitants, three alien but non-humanoid races, did not fall. Thus, there's no need for a parallel redemption involving incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection. It's now that we begin to see what Lewis is doing in his Cosmic Trilogy and Narnian Chronicles. He's making myths. Indeed, as Carpenter reports, Lewis precisely wanted to give the Christian story a fresh excitement by retelling it as if it were a new myth. The term bent one is very apt because it immediately puts pay to any tendency to promote the ontological status of evil as actually existing. And in retranslating the notion of privatio boni, privation of good, that Augustine and Aquinas would have evil be, as a bending away from the good, we see that evil only exists as a negative and is thus not the creation of God, nor an independent entity co-equal with him. There's more I would say about the book, but the one I find most interesting in terms of theodicy, which is a justification of God in the face of suffering, is the second instalment in the trilogy, Perilandra. Perilandra is the name Lewis gives to the planet Venus, and you have to forgive his astrophysics. He published it in 1943. So Lewis imagines Venus, Perilandra, to be made of floating islands, excepting one fixed island. Rational life has just been created, a green lady and a green king. Maleldil, God, has sent the hero from the first book, who's a Cambridge philologist called Ransom, almost certainly modelled on Tolkien, incidentally, to counter the demonically possessed Cambridge Don Weston's arguments. Weston, by giving himself over to the Bent One, becomes an unman. Maleldil has commanded the, that the Lady and King may not stay overnight on the one fixed land, otherwise anything goes. Much of the book's narrative presents arguments for and against disobeying this commandment. The imagined temptation narrative is, I think, a stroke of imaginal genius. In Out of the Silent Planet, it's explained that the Bent One, Satan, had it in his mind to spoil other worlds beside his own, as Lulconja, not her. There was a great war, and the other angels drove him back out of the heavens and bound him in the air of his own world. Thus, Lulconja is blemished, and there is death in and decay. Now, this is similar to the magician's nephews, where, though the world is not five hours old, an evil has entered it already. This evil is the white witch, Jadis, brought into Narnia by Diggory, who succumbed to temptation in the city of Charm. Now, even though this part of the story is reminiscent of Genesis, the whole of Narnia does not fall, but is invaded by evil and acquainted with grief. It is spoiled. Yet Aslan promises, although evil will come of that evil, I will see to it that the worst falls upon myself. And as Adam's race has done the harm, Adam's race shall help to heal it. Throughout the two sets of stories, it's consistently mankind that repeats the Genesis disaster and corrupts new worlds. And interestingly, in The Magician's Nephew, Polly is almost certainly blameless for what Diggory does in the Hall of Images. Further, Diggory is given a chance of redemption when the witch tempts him a second time, and he does not fall. This is after he's received a lion's kiss and becomes born again, so to speak. This is not automatically safeguard Diggory from temptation, but he is enabled to resist it with the strength of Aslan. Thus we see Lewis's theme is not merely one of representing the fall, but of demonstrating how we all meet temptation and how we must struggle through it. For those who accept Darwinian evolution and thus reject the historicity of Genesis 3, Lewis's new myths serve to explicate the theology behind the Genesis myth. The great premise in all of this is the desire of God to create free creatures. In The Magician's Nephew, Aslan calls Narnia awake with the three words, love, think, speak. The purpose of our creation is to become older, as the Green Lady says. Thus Lewis quite clearly irons out the objection and misapprehension that God punished us for wanting to know. 
Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy is derived from that mistake. The authority, according to Pullman, is afraid of creatures becoming conscious and free-thinking. At the end of the Amber Spyglass, the hero and heroine help vanquish the forces of the Kingdom of God in order to set up the Republic of Heaven. Pullman instantly admitted to me in a letter, I, I wrote to him when I was 18 with a poem uh, I'd written um, praising his novels but pointing out his theological errors, that my quarrel, of course, is not with God who never existed, but with the human being who have used the idea of God in order to suppress and exploit their fellows. I think C.S. Lewis was an apologist for this non-existent tyrant, and I dislike his work profoundly. Well, <laughs> aside from the bitterness towards the non-existent tyrant, it seems that Pullman has rather misunderstood the nature of the fool as presented by Lewis. It's quite apparent that sentient life is the desire of Maleldil Aslan, God. Chlau, as they are called throughout the cosmic trilogy, and the talking beasts of Narnia are set apart and given authority over the dumb beasts. Moreover, at the end of Perlandra, the king says that we will make the nobler beasts so wise that they will become Chlau and speak. Their lives shall awake to a new life in us as we awake in Maleldil. The tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil was thus forbidden not because God did not want us to know, as the serpent says, that your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Rather, God wants us to know in the right way. Being acquainted with evil and surpassing temptation, the green lady is wiser yet and understands the reason for not yet living on the fixed land, now so plainly. Her desire to live on the fixed land was to reject the wave, to draw my hands out of my elders, to say to him, not thus, but thus. To put in our own power what times should roll towards us. That would have been cold love and feeble trust. And out of it, how could we ever have climbed back into that love and trust again? You note the lady borrows the uh, metaphor of water because it's familiar to explore the unfamiliar. So there's another layer of imaginal sub-creation in the novel. Now the king says, We learned of evil, though not as the evil one wished us to learn. We have learned better than that, and we know it more, for it is waking that understands sleep, and not sleep that understands waking. There is an ignorance of evil that comes from being young. There is a darker ignorance that comes from doing it. The great 20th century theologian Karl Barth rightly points out that in the history of theology and dogma, there have been many blind alleys which had to be followed to the point where they were proved to be such in order that they should no longer be confused with the right way and in order to make necessary and to stir up a search for the right way. This, I think, is the beauty of story. That by supposing one can explore a blind alley to expose it as such. Through the temptation narrative of the Green Lady in Perlanger, Lewis is able to comment on the temptation in our own world and to highlight certain blind alleys in our theology. For by attempting to get into the mindset of the devil, he does this most famously in the acclaimed screw tape letters, Lewis shows us the subtlety of his arguments and puts up a, a T to warn us of the dead end ahead, the blind alley, the T junction. The carol, Adam Leigh Bounden, sung far too often at Christmas time, has these words for its last two verses. Nay had the apple taken bin, the apple taken bin, Never would our lady have been heaven's queen. Blessed be the time the apple taken was. Therefore we moan sing in Deo gratias. Thanks be to God. One of the important moments in Perlanger is when the unman tries to use this same Felix Culpa, fortunate fool, argument to tempt the green lady, referring to the fall of Thalcondra. It was the breaking of the commandment which brought Maleldil to our world, and because of which he was made man. Ransom replies, of course good came out of it. Whatever you do, he will make good out of it. But not the good he had prepared for you if you had obeyed him. That is lost forever. The first king and first mother of our own world did the forbidden thing, and he brought good out of it in the end. But what they did was not good. Thus Lewis clearly steers clear of a fortunate fall theology in favour of a theology of eucatastrophe. It's a phrase invented by Tolkien, and it means good turn. However, because all we know is our own history, 
of Fallen Redemption, it has been hitherto all too easy to say glibly, Christ's redemptive work brought us higher than Edenic Paradise, Felix Bacarta Made. It is, then, not too great a step to think, therefore the fall was a good thing. But what Lewis does in Perilange is to present a world which does not fall, but remains in the state of paradise. We do not bemoan the fact that there will be no incarnate Christ on that world. Its inhabitants communicate directly with Maldil, the eternal son of God. Similarly, it is not portrayed as something better. Rather, we are told, never did he make two things the same. Never did he utter one word twice. After a falling, not a recovery, but a new creation. This is why Lewis's imaginal theology is better than Leibniz's notion of the best possible world which Voltaire lampooned with ease in his novel Candide, also worth reading. In other words, Lewis's great might be. His story invites us to receive the wave Malelda sends, the adventure that Aslan sends. It invites us to surrender our wills to God's will and say, you know best, Lord. Karl Barth writes that all sin has its being and origin in the fact that man wants to be his own judge. In supposing what happens when man lets God be the judge, Lewis is able to make this theological point without systematising it or asserting it. It is a much better theological method, I think. We then see his eschatological vision in the end of Perilangia and the final Narnian book, The Last Battle, which becomes almost entirely platonic when the real world is revealed as the children say goodbye to the Shadowlands and the professor, who is not unlike um, the headmaster or principal of House of Mr. Sixth Form, Mr. Hanscom, or the sort of teacher that I would like to be, says, This will in Plato, <laughs> what do they teach them in these schools? Mr. Hanscom incidentally likes Last Battle the least, but it is full of interesting theological and philosophical ideas, such as the dwarves, who lack imagination to realise their good situation. I would happily give just another lecture about Narnia, but time's running out and I want to talk uh, more about me, or rather, my own work. The imaginal is almost a relocation of our knowledge and unknowing, a process begun in childhood. Tolkien points out that a child may well believe a report that there are ogres in the next country. Many grown-up persons find it easy to believe of another country, and as for another planet, very few adults seem able to imagine it as people, if at all, by anything but monsters of iniquity. Lewis, in an early essay defended the genre of science fiction, saying it was a natural evolution of the fairy story, where the unknown, the forest, has become space, the final frontier. I suggest the next frontier is time, and so it is to time travel that I've been turning my imaginal attention. Just a quick time travel thought experiment will demonstrate why I think that time travel in particular can unlock certain theological mysteries one of which is how human freedom can be compatible with God's omniscience. If God knows everything, surely we're not free. Well, this is not so. If I ask you, everyone watching this, to write down a random number, it doesn't have to be an integer, from one to infinity, and then I took all your pieces of paper and I time-travelled back and um, stuck them under your seats, you would, at first, I think I had magical or psychical abilities or something, when you discovered I knew your choices. If I explained my time travel, you'd think that's fine. I mean, hopefully you'd be a bit impressed by the time travel, but you wouldn't think that my happening to know what numbers you'd chosen would have forced you to choose what numbers you'd do. I started writing stories as soon as I could read, age three. Somewhere in my mother's house is an appalling photograph of me as a child, and in the back of the frame of that photograph, she's kept my oldest surviving story. I'm sure it'll fetch millions at Sotheby's one day, uh, if you all, of course, buy my books. My brother and I would make up radio plays in an old cassette recorder, and we fed our imaginations with a healthy diet of C.S. Lewis, Laura Ingalls Wilder, Montgomery, Austin, Enid Blyton, and later, Bill and Ted. When I was a teenager, I started writing song lyrics in my band, Random Believers, and the second one, The Senators. Uh, both were terrible. Actually, some of the songs were quite good. I just couldn't sing and my friends couldn't play the guitar very well. 
uh, I think mostly I'm proud of a lyric I wrote for my best friend James, a uh, song, Life is Nothing But the Doctor's Intervention. Anyway, I digress. I then thought I should start to write some proper poetry. I'd experimented with war poetry, and then having watched Dead Poet Society for the nth time, and taking t- to heart the hero Mr Keating's thesis that poetry was made for one purpose, men to woo women, I thought I'd have more success securing a romantic partner if I could master the art of writing sonnets and other forms of love poetry. It worked. Quite well, actually. I've been happily married for uh, almost five years now. Uh, Of course, whether my wife says the same is another matter. But I also sought to explore some more theological themes. You can read a collection of some of my sonnets in the poetry section of House Westminster Library, Criticism is, of course, invited. However, I was temporarily put off writing poetry when, at the end of my first year examinations at university, I decided to write a sonnet instead of an essay on the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Kodovich. I commend it to you as long uh, with the rest of his and Wordsworth's collection of lyrical ballads, incidentally. Sadly, I was failed for this contribution, and uh, was giving a bit of a ticking off, and... Uh, third class for my first year, thus fulfilling my director of studies prophecy at the end of my first Michaelmas term that, Tristan, people like you come to Cambridge and get firsts or thirds. You're not getting a first. I still, as my infant school report said, tread my own idiosyncratic path. So I'd always wanted to write a novel and began it with my second year at uni, completing it in my third It's 104,000 words of almost entirely appalling writing with a mediocre love story, some poor science fiction and unsophisticated theology. Honestly, it is awful. But, they say, after 10,000 hours practising something, you become an expert. I can't claim I have 10,000 hours on the novel or being an expert, but I think I have learned how not to write. I exposed some blind alleys. So I next turned my attention to plays and wrote a prequel to Hamlet in verse. I'm still quite proud of and would like to perform at some point. I was shocked by the idea of reading Carpenter's biography The Inklings when researching my final dissertation on C.S. Lewis. So I, I wrote a play first and only after tackled the dissertation. After graduating, I wrote, three com- I wrote three comedy plays, which I also produced in Kent. I actually made a few quid on them, which was rather pleasing, but better was to read some reviews and hear people discussing the ideas I tried to present. The Parachutists discussed the ethics and folly of and in war, whilst my dark comedy, Fifty Ways to Leave Your Father, about two twenty-somethings forced to live back at home for economic reasons, who plot to kill their dad, is really about redemption. Those Who Can Teach is about truth, as well as teaching and faith. After this, and some short films, I went back to something I've always been passionate about, time travel, and have published the first three in my Times Fickle Glass series for young adults, intelligent teenagers, or adults, that is, especially you. You are kind of my target audience. I hope you'll agree that they're good stories, and there's a bit of mystery running through the first two books, but it's essentially a vehicle for discussing all kinds of philosophical, ethical, and theological ideas. Perhaps more than any other genre, time travel gives us the simulation of eternity and appearance of omniscience. Athlan in the Narnian Chronicles never tells you someone else's story. He never says what might have happened if. That is entirely right for Aslan. But with time travel, you can explore what might be or might have been and raise further questions. I don't want to spoil the books for you because I do hope you'll read them, but in a nutshell, there are warring factions of time travellers in the future who have different ethical codes. Indeed, not merely codes, but adopt different normative approaches to meta-ethics. What we even mean by good. So the Historical Improvement Society, they want to kill Hitler. The Domino Group wants not to interfere with the timeline. Whether things are right because of their consequences or intrinsically can be actually shown with time travel. But like Plato, I prefer to present dialectic. That is, I leave it to you, the reader, to determine which side is right and which wrong. Time travel also enables me to discuss ideas of predestination nature versus nurture, and so forth. The bits I said in the past are properly historically researched. The bits in the future I imagine, of course. One thing I imagine, for example, in the second book, The Golden Rule, is a technology that allows people to change their skin colour 
as we might dye our hair today. I imagine this means that people will literally not think about other people's ethnicities. Here's an extract. Who's your favourite? came a voice from behind. I turned around and locked eyes with a girl of about my age. She had sky blue plaited hair and smiled broadly. I can't wait to see to meet her myself. She must be quite something to manage all our food and the economy. I didn't know what to say to this, so I just smiled back. I mean, it's one thing to see the gods on the news, but can you actually be actually going to meet them? N no, I said truthfully. I can't. And I like that Demeter's chosen to be black this year, don't you? Chosen to be... I repeated rather stupidly. It's why I've decided to stick with this skin for another month. Do you like it? She said. It's very... I faltered. <laughs> it must have been so funny when people couldn't change their appearance so easily. Like being stuck with one hair colour all your life. No wonder there were race issues. If everyone saw their self-identity as being synonymous with skin colour, at least that's what my dad thinks. Yes, I said stupidly. And then, realising the implications of what she was saying, took a proper look at her. Her skin was brown, like the bark of an old oak tree, but her features were pointed, her lips thin and her eyes blue. If I had to guess, I'd have thought she'd been born Caucasian. I wondered how many of the other students in the rainbow of races had changed their skin colour. How do people recognise each other, though, if their appearance was changed so drastically? Perhaps that was part of the problem. A 21st century hang-up. Noticing someone's skin colour before anything else about them. Perhaps the present wasn't so bad after all. Another of my themes is evil. And those of you who are familiar with narrative theories such as the structuralist movement of the 20th century, Levi Strauss and Roland Barthes, for example, will see what tremendous fun you can have with binary oppositions and props character functions with time travel. As I write, I, like Tolkien, have tried to create a secondary world. It's not a geographical, of course, but a temporal world, and so I call it a chronoverse as opposed to a universe, or multiverse as in Narnia. I'm still discovering things about it. I'm currently writing a series of um, short story tie-ins, and a couple of years ago I wrote a book in a different genre as I prepared to write the third in the Times Fickle Square series, The Greater Good. The greater good's themes are most obviously the problem of suffering and forgiveness. And it took me a while to write. I visited Auschwitz, uh, where a lot of the book is set. Anyway, I'm aware this has become an advert for my writing, but the reason I uh, write all this and include it in the, the lecture is because I'm excited to explore and discuss theological ideas, but I recognise with Karl Barth that there can be no complete work. All human achievements are little more than polygomina, and this is especially the case, he says, in the field of theology. I've talked a lot about novels because I believe the novel is a form par excellence of imaginal theology, particularly conversion stories, the religious experience, such as the hook upon the thread and the operation of divine grace and the burgeoning God consciousness, which becomes conscience both in Evil in War and Jan Martel in Bride's Head Revisited and Life of Pi, respectively. At the end of Life of Pi, the insurance investigators cannot believe Pi's story. They find it too fantastic because it's beyond their comprehension. You don't really expect us to believe you, do you? Conifer's trees are a bitch eating algae that produces fresh water. <laughs> Tree dwelling aquatic rodents. These things don't exist. Only because you've never seen them. <laughs> That's why we believe what we see. They demand another story that they can believe. And the reader is invited to reflect upon which of the two stories, the one that conforms to the known natural laws, or the supernatural one, is the true story. But, the author suggests, they have lacked imagination and missed the better story. 
Only when we open up our minds to possibilities beyond the empirical are we led out of the platonic cave of ignorance and delusion, and this is the work of the imaginal. For how else can we discover that there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy? And how else can we realise with Wordsworth? Our destiny, our being's heart and home, is with infinitude and only there. And so finally, I commend to you imaginal theology as the best and most honest methodology. For as Tennyson remarks, our little systems have their day, they have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O Lord, art more than they. Thank you.